Hey everyone, welcome to Season 1, Episode 11 of the Manly Hanley Podcast. This is the podcast with no limits on what we'll cover. I'm your host, Randy, and with me I have my co-host, Vic, sitting here. Have a snack, sit back, and relax. This episode is recorded on Sunday, May 26th, 2019. I hope everyone's having a great Memorial Day weekend. I posted a little blurb on randyhanley.com, Twitter, and the Manly Hanley Podcast Facebook page regarding this. And this is the announcement. We have a big giveaway that podcasters or any type of musician will want to jump on right away. We're doing a giveaway of Studio One Professional that sells for like 400 bucks. I use it, and it's worth every penny. But um, I will announce the winner next Sunday, June 2nd, uh, about 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And this is our biggest giveaway yet, and I've said that for every giveaway, and it's totally true. The thing is, it's going to eventually become impossible to pass up the previous giveaways because I don't know how much bigger we can go. With that, thank you to Personas for making this huge giveaway possible. All right, for today's episode, it applies mainly to podcasters, but it can be useful to anyone recording audio on their computer. So I'm going to share with you my five podcast audio tips that they apply right directly to you if you're recording a podcast, and I think these could be of value. So take what you will. Let's start out. Um, My first one I would say is no wireless. Don't worry about aesthetics over quality and reliability. Wired is better than wireless in almost every case. If you are doing any sort of live stream, it shouldn't even be a thought whether or not you're going to be on Wi-Fi or hardwired via Ethernet cable. That's my opinion. But um, I don't know. The year is 2019 and a wired connection is still far more reliable than a wireless one. We're not there yet. I know it looks cooler. You got your desk there. It looks like a stock photography image. You got this perfect desk, right? Just a cup of coffee, computer, and I don't know, maybe a notepad. And, you know, just minimalist, no cables. It's not real, man. You, it, cable is more reliable. That's my opinion. For recording and, you know, even even cell phone chargers, it's just more efficient to have a cable going into your device. It's uh, wireless charging is a waste of energy. It looks cool. And it's useful in some, you know, types of setups where you just can't have a cable there, right? But for reliability and just getting the highest quality, use a wire. If you're thinking this tip doesn't apply to other areas, keep listening because this applies especially to audio as well. While there's there's very reliable wireless mic units out there, use a wired setup whenever you can. Uh, obviously, there are going to be situations where you can't avoid using a wireless setup. And that makes total sense for things such as on-stage presentations, you know, like if you're going to have to cross paths with the, with the people over and over again and just stepping over a wire. But if, if you're sitting in a studio, though, just wire it up. If, if you have to end up troubleshooting an issue, it makes things much easier in the long run. Quickly moving to tip number two. Remember, there's five of these, so... Not going to be a super long episode, but I think this is going to be of high value to many people. Start with the signal. Look up signal to noise ratio. I'll post a link to it in the show notes. But in short, it's a measure of the level of the desired signal, that is your voice. Think of your voice as the signal. The level of that to the level of the background noise. In recording, that that is the instrument, which is your voice or an instrument that you're mic- miking up, right? And it's measured against the level of the background noise. You're going to want more of the signal, more of that than the noise. So I see a lot of videos where the speaker is pretty far from the microphone, similar to a talk show host you see on television, such as, think of back with Dave Letterman, maybe. And you know, he's got that mic on his desk. It looks kind of retro and cool to have that microphone on your desk. 
But keep in mind that those professional studios have capabilities beyond using one microphone. There may be shotgun microphones above the camera shot. There's lavalier mics and more. And these are highly directional microphones that can pick up a specific area very clearly. So you probably don't have that. And then you're putting that mic on the desk and sitting a foot, two feet away. It's You're going to get some room noise. And I... Uh, I take part in some audio forums where I where I support other users and share my knowledge and I, you know, receive tips from them as well in other areas. And a common one is the the noise of the room and it's you don't have that problem if you sit close enough to the mic where you got a good balance where it's not distorting but it sounds good. You want a good signal to noise ratio. Practice that first before you get into anything else and you worry about, you know, other areas. You need to worry about this as your first step in setting things up okay um many of us are not in a professional broadcasting studio so that's why it's important to make the absolute best of what uh, what you have okay um make certain you're using a cardioid microphone kind of if you're just starting especially if you're the main person doing your podcast for basic just starting out podcasters you'll commonly see them using a blue yeti microphone i did an episode I think it was a couple weeks ago, called Audio Check, where I talk about how USB microphones such as this Blue Yeti are good for starters, but I still recommend an XLR microphone and a real mixer that you plug it into for seriously future-proofing your podcast. If your only option is currently the Yeti, this YouTuber, Hazel is her name, she has a great video that shows some of the things you can do to get a decent sound out of that microphone. And I still wouldn't call it absolute pro quality. Um, it sounds good, though. So, and she probably does the best with it that I've seen as far as when you go to set it up. Um, signal to noise is probably one of those areas where I could do an entire episode about it. Stay out of the red. That's that's one first tip. When you, when you hit zero decibels, that's when you're doing your mic level check. You will experience digital distortion. Unlike analog distortion, digital is not as forgiving. When you go above zero dB, think of it like when a TV loses a signal and it looks like crap. It just cuts out or sounds real staticky. That will happen with your voice quality in the recording if you go into zero dB or the red. If you're going to scream to get a point across during a podcast, for example, you could back away from the mic uh, the moment you're about to do it, which could decrease the pickup of the sound by, I don't know, 20 dB or more yet you can still get the point across because the perceiving sound is loud. So if I go, what's going on? It didn't distort the mic at all. But you could notice that I screamed, right? Just like think of a guitar player when they turn on that distortion. It's perceived as louder because it's dirtier. It's just loud. It's grungy. But it might not actually be louder in volume. So that's an important tip to consider is if you're going to scream at the mic, don't do it right at the mic because this is what digital distortion might sound like. Don't do that. I, I wouldn't, unless you really want to make people not happy with your sound. Um, I might edit this out too, by the way. <laughs> um, another thing to consider is a pop filter. However you want to do this, it's an easy way to avoid explosive P's or plosives, as people refer to them as. Um, some microphones, such as the Shure SM7B that I'm currently talking in, have a pop filter built in. It's like that little, you know, foamy grill kind of thing. Uh, the, the ones that are built in into the mic itself. But if you have a condenser microphone, you'll typically want to use a pop filter. It looks like a screen. And I've even seen some homemade ones using nylons stretched over, uh, stretched over a coat hanger. You can avoid this manual labor and buy one for like, I don't know, $16, I think. I'm going to post that in the show notes. I think the one I have is from like 20 years ago, and it's called Pop Stopper or Popper Stopper. And it, it, work, it works really well. I use that on my condenser microphone that I sometimes speak from for this episode or for this uh, show. Let's move on to the next one. It's acceptable to use effects. Um, before we had all this awesome, affordable audio technology available on our computers, you sort of had to expect to buy physical effects processing hardware that could hook up to your recording device, such as an ADAT or a tape recorder and others. Um, a lot of you might not even be old enough to know what those things are or care, but nowadays you can plug a microphone into your computer, record yourself, and add some effects after your recording was produ produced. And again, you could do a lot of this stuff back then, but it was much more difficult and extremely expensive at times. I think an ADAT, when it first came out, 
I don't know, some of them were like three, four grand maybe. Might be wrong. Maybe they were cheaper, but I, I think they were over a couple thousand for sure. Um, again, yeah, you could do a lot of this back then, but trust me, it takes a lot of experience. And there's guys who still record like that to, to get a good sound because they're good at it and they're professional. They do it for a living. For the scenario I'm describing, we're just recording one instrument, and that's your human voice, not 12 microphones over a drum set or two on guitar cabinets, just literally one microphone. So we plug that microphone in, we record our episode. Then afterwards, in your favorite DAW, it's referred to as a digital audio workstation, DAW, or a waveform editor, maybe Audacity, right? You can apply effects to polish up your episode after you record it. So here's the effects I'm using on this episode right now. This is what my, my voice is going through after I've sent this to the internet and it's been processed. I apply compression with approximately 3 to 1 ratio, sometimes 2 to 1, a slow attack, and a medium release. I could do an entire episode on compression, but I've included a link in the description, show notes, that it gives you a nice explanation. Basically, my goal is to make my voice sound more present and clearer for the main mix without it sounding completely over the top. It, you'll notice it's pretty loud, but that's you don't have to turn up your volume high to hear it. Another effect I'm using is very light EQ. Basically, with EQ, that's equalization, you can increase or decrease the presence of different ranges of audio. Think of a high frequency as something similar to like a high-pitched whistle. And a low frequency is something like that boomy bass in many types of music. With EQ, you can turn a dial to kind of increase the parts of your voice to make it sound clearer. Full disclaimer, the need for EQ is your personal preference, and it will depend on many different factors, such as the microphone type you're using um, or how present in front of the microphone you are, which is why I covered that signal-to-noise ratio portion first. EQ can also be personal preference. Just use it when you really believe you need it, Like, right? It's just an example would be when you're listening to back to your recording and you're hearing your voice may have been picked up a little. It might have it might have been muffled the way it was picked up. Well, you can just boost the higher frequencies or even decrease some mid range to fix that. And I mean, maybe you can't fix it. Sometimes you can't if it's so bad, but you can try, right? It's worth it. And you could save yourself from having to re-record everything is the goal. Uh, the last effect I'm using is a limiter. And basically, I think all these things are built into Audacity. I don't use Audacity anymore, but it has a lot of these basic effects built in. And with limiting, basically, I say basically a lot, if there are parts of my audio recording where my voice was picked up too loud, too loudly, and the volume of the recording is louder than the rest of my mix, with limiting, I could think of it, think of setting a, like a, a limbo bar, and you're setting a level where any sound that tries to go above that gets chopped off. But there are other um, areas of limiting as well, such as makeup gain, and you can you can use those too. That's where you can basically boost the quieter audio, and it can make the overall mix louder while still chopping off anything that hits that bar, if you will, that you set. So that does it for my effects recommendations. Uh, number four, let's go with diving in and just buying a recording interface. So nowadays, they're so affordable and will open you up to the possibility of doing a professional sounding recording. You don't even have to go really big to get a professional capability. My favorite brand, and I'm not being paid to say this, is Personas. As I've mentioned it in a few episodes, they support their products extremely well, and you don't have to buy their most expensive setup to have professional sound quality. They have audio interfaces that have two microphone inputs, such as the AudioBox 96. I think that's the model. Um, there's like a there's another one I think too, but the audio interface works over USB. It used to be I had to like USB used to be crap for doing audio, and nowadays it's a real contender. I use it in my mixer now. Uh, it used to be you had to find a FireWire interface or you know Thunderbolt Type One, Two, or Three for for Mac, if you will. You don't have to go through all that now. USB is more universal. It's in the name. And you can um, universal serial bus, I believe. So <laughs> that's why I said it's in the name. But like this audio box 96, for instance, works over USB, but it allows you to plug in a professional level XLR microphone, which that's what professional mics use. They use the XLR plug in standard. They even sell a basic version of this interface in a kit, which includes uh, a starter mic, headphones and software. 
in that main unit. So in my opinion, do not waste your money on a standalone USB mic while you could buy something like this first. This setup gives you much, much more capability, and I will link to that in the description. So I don't have to dive into this one as much either because one of the previous episodes about audio check was basically kind of it's this that's what this point number four is centered around is is you know usb versus uh, xlr recording so check out that episode if you haven't or if this tip number four applies to you the last one is do not over edit it doesn't sound as natural or honest in my opinion i figure if you're going to edit something do it for the listener it almost reminds me of an extremely vain like vlogger video. You've probably seen these videos where the vlogger can't get through half of a sentence without cutting it out, chopping, editing it up, you know, and skipping the video to different segments. It's like a bad surgery or something. I don't know. If your podcast sounds like a natural conversation, it can feel more relatable to the listener as if they're sitting there right next to you taking part. You might be able to tell I'm reading a bit of this from my notes, which I am. But I'm also adding to the notes, and I don't chop much of my recording out at all. If I edit back to my episode, I do notice I have a bit of ums and ahs here and there. Like, the phone just rang a moment ago. I stopped and then continued. I didn't, like, just, you know, chop to a different part. I left off right where I stopped, right at the end of a sentence, and deleted it, you know? Like, just, it's like a half second where that phone rang, came in, and I talked to somebody and came back. But for the most part, I'm not going to just finish this on another day. I'm going to do this all right now. And when I go listen back to it, I'll notice there's a, bo- a bunch of ums, ahs. But we can all be harsh on ourselves when we hear our own voice, right? I think it's healthiest to just go with the flow, record it, and let it go. While it might be tempting to chop out some of those ums and ahs, I just let it go. It saves time, and the ums and ahs don't really take up that much time. Your podcast may be different where you might want to add some effects here and there as well, and that can be fun. My preference is just rather, it's simple, and with the least amount of post-editing, because I'm all about being efficient. If I have an intro track, me talking, an outro track, that's good enough for me. It works for me. And if people, they, they know what to expect the next time they listen to my show. With that, I would love to thank all of you and our guest, Vic the Cat, who sat here and said nothing today. And thanks for putting time aside to listen to the podcast. If you are a new listener to the Manly Handley podcast, we would love to hear from you. Visit our website and leave a comment. While you're there, be sure to subscribe to the newsletter. Also, follow Randrums on Twitter and be sure to like the Manly Handley podcast Facebook page. Thanks a lot, everyone, for listening and have a great day.